Hi, I'm Dr. Boaz Ben David, and this video will be sort of an introduction to the first part in a trio of semesters where we plunge in the world of cognitive psychology. The first one is Introduction to Cognitive Psychology. I want to give you some of the flavors of what is cognitive psychology, how do we do cognitive psychology when we do. A little bit of history first. In the beginning, it all started around the 1850s, and then the idea was introspection. The whole theory behind it was that who is the best person to know what's going on in your mind but yourself? So scientists in Germany, Leipzig specifically, would sit in an armchair and think, what are we thinking about? How are we thinking? For example, when they wanted to really understand vision, they will close one eye, go ahead, do it now, and try to paint, draw the world exactly as it looks like from one eye. Those of you who are actually doing it may note that they have a nose. So our world is limited by the shape of our nose. Okay, take off your head now. Let's move to the second stage. In the second stage, in the beginning of the 20th century, the main paradigm was taken from behaviorism. For example, the basic idea is that we are not different than a mouse. So we can take this mouse, place it in a box, and we can now manipulate the independent variable. For example, for how many hours do we prevent water from this mouse? And then we put a lever, we place a lever inside the box. When he pushes the lever, he gets one drop of water. More pushes on this lever and more water comes out. So here is the paradigm. We have an independent variable, how many hours of uh, being without water in the box, and we have a dependent variable, which says, will he push the lever? Will he learn quickly how to push the lever? How, what, how frequent will he be his pushes on this lever? Right? Remember, the more pushes, the more water. This is all nice. But then came cognitive psychology and said, wait a minute, this is not enough. There is something inside. There is one mediating factor that we cannot see, that maybe it's going to be very difficult to test. But this mediating factor is the one that's leading his behavior. And the mediating factor in this example is simply first. Let's examine some of the criticism in that area. For example, Language. If you are a strict behaviorist, you will believe that how do kids learn to speak? Very simply, when my daughter said, Abba, Daddy, I applauded her and said, Great. The basic idea is that if you're a strict behaviorist, language should be taught simply by giving these kinds of reinforcements. This is, of course, nonsense. Obviously, kids learn language in a different way. We'll talk specifically about this in the second semester. Another thing to ponder about would be an event that happened in World War II, a read event. Scientists noticed that the radar operators were making mistakes. The task was very simple. All you had to do is to push a button when you see an enemy submarine getting closer. You see an enemy submarine, you press the button, and siren comes out and everybody's running. You don't see a yellow submarine, you don't press, you don't push the button. Very simple. Yet, those radar operators, in many cases, were pushing the button when no ship was around. In other cases, they were not pushing it, even though a ship was right in front of them. Why are they doing this? If it's simply stimulus response, they shouldn't do these kind of things. Everything should be so simple and transparent. You may feel this if you have a cell phone and I'm guessing that most of you do have a cell phone, and then you are sure it's ringing, and you search in your pockets, but it didn't. Or in other cases, it is ringing, and you've missed it. Understanding what's going on there is part of what we do in cognitive psychology. To sum up, the basic idea of cognitive psychology is that you cannot explain human behavior just as a system of stimuli and responses, as a system of reinforcements. 
There is something else. There are hidden processes that happen in the middle, cognitive processes like attention, memory, imagination, perception. And in cognitive psychology, we specifically focus on them and try to understand how are they impacted by the external stimuli and how do they impact your behavior. Before we, we really go deep in the world of cognitive psychology, we have to get some understanding. In cognitive psychology, we're highly focused on being scientific. Maybe this is some sort of a biology envy or a physics envy. This goes to the Freudians in the crowd. So if I'm conducting experiment, I have my results, I publish it, and you're reading my, ex my experiment, I want to make sure that you can replicate it in your lab and get the same results. If you don't, then my science was not good enough because we want to make sure this is real. The other issue is that we want to get all of the different operations we're doing, all of the different experiments, to all to come up to one thing. In other words, since we're testing something that is hidden from the eye, I cannot now um, saw your head in two, take out something and say, hmm, this is your attention, right? I have to test it through other means. The means are tasks. And these tasks are what we manipulate inside cognitive psychology. Let's examine the following task. It is called visual search. Your task is to try to identify whether in the area in front of you we have a grid triangle. Now let's see what I can manipulate. I can manipulate how many distractors will be. There could be few distractors or many distractors. We can manipulate the level of similarity between the target and the distractor. They can be very similar, which makes it difficult, or dissimilar. I can limit you in time. Come on, you have one second. Answer quickly. You can respond by looking at the specific target, and I can monitor it by, via an eye tracker. You can respond by using dense, dense revolution. Step forward when you see the task. You can measure how accurate you are. And the hypothesis behind it is that as the process becomes more and more complex, it will take you longer to be able to respond, to be able to detect the red triangle. As the process becomes more and more complex and more difficult, you make more errors. So accuracy, reaction time, but as we'll see in class, there are many, many more examples. So what are we doing? We cannot really measure attention, even though it impacts your behavior. So what we're measuring are the traces of the cognitive process that we cannot see. We're looking for the traces. Think of yourself as a scientist walking in the jungle. There was an elephant there. It was a big elephant. But you cannot see the elephant because it's not here anymore. But you can see its footsteps. So you know we have an elephant and he is limping. To summarize, in cognitive psychology, our focus is in the cognitive processes that are mediating between the stimuli and your responses. We're trying to see what's there inside. We cannot see it with our own eyes. We cannot weigh it with our hands. So what we're left with is trying to use different tasks. We can manipulate these tasks by varying the independent factors. We can look at different dependent factors, and by doing this, we get a better picture about what's going on. These tasks are actually are mimicking something real. That this specific task of visual search is mimicking something real, a real cognitive process. Now, of course, this is not enough. So we need more and more evidence, and all of these evidence should all support a certain theory that tells us what's actually going on. As a teaser of the interesting tasks that we can use, and we'll see in the following class,